One of the things that I, I want to go off and, and really pursue is, uh, particularly Stephen in your last comments and your comments, Susan, initially is looking at the center of uh, the city becoming a dominant center in the landscape politically, economically, culturally, et cetera. Does that, and Enrique and I have had these conversations before, I'm, I'm very pro city state in terms of the evolution of governance and development and so forth. And does, does that portend the rise of the city state as the dominant entity of, as opposed to the state itself? Um, I can only really comment on the US. And one of the tensions for the US is our, um, how do I put it, our boundaries, our political boundaries have nothing to do with our economic realities. So if you think about uh, New York City, which is the area that I'm most familiar with, the New York metro region actually has about 20 million people in it, and it spills over into New Jersey, Connecticut, and Long Island. All sorts of different political structures. I mean, it's not even like there are just three other people at the table because, you know, Connecticut itself, we actually spill over into several different mm -hmm. municipalities. So. And this alludes to that problem I, I mentioned earlier, that for the U.S. to manage those sort of big regional projects is actually proving very complicated. Looking out on the world, uh, and I actually should just you know, turn to other folks, I think places like Singapore, which is a nice, which is really sort of the classic example mm -hmm. of the city-state, yep, yeah. have demonstrated that that kind of a city-state model mm -hmm. has a lot of flexibility, a lot of ability to plan and do things well. Uh, arguably, Dubai has tried to follow that sort of model, but sorry, th those are my thoughts. Yeah. Susan, any additional thoughts on that? Um, you know, I think to the extent that the dominant classes live in cities, mm -hmm. that you know, definitely disproportionate power is located there. But um, this newest wave of democratization in, in developing countries, the so-called third wave of democracy, um, that there has really been a, a uh, expansion of the franchise uh, to the population at large, which has given rural populations much more um, import than they had had in the past. So you have countries such as Bolivia right now that have an indigenous, so-called indigenous uh, president, which would have been unheard of, um, well, till, until the turn of the century. Uh, when they had very little political power. So in some sense, I think there, there is some redistribution of, of, of power. It's not easy because the elite still have a lot of informal power. Um, but I, I wouldn't say there's just a mechanistic kind of shift of power to the cities um, in, in this new age with the political power becoming more dispersed. And with these enormous waves of migration moving to the urban centers, whether the it's the center where the elites are uh, living or the peri-urban centers where the service... Right. So you could say, actually, the political power if, if with migration is, is shifting it to the city, but it, it's in part shifting away from the dominant classes and, and bringing rise to new kinds of tensions between who has the economic power and who has the political power and kind of in a way that is really without precedent globally. And... And from there's the push pull, as you say. Part of part of the inclusion is enumeration, uh, title to land, and so forth, and and developments or evolution of those sorts of policies at the city level. What do you see happening in terms of your area of research around progressive policies and programs related to that? Well, uh, first of all, I want to go back a step, and I, I don't think Singapore is a model for the developing world. I, I mean, it's it's good in what it does, but it really is a city state. It, it's you know, in terms of its population and the economy, is is very atypical for the world. You can't have many uh, Singapores in this world, um, sort of center of in international finance. So. It, you could argue it's very good what they've done, and it is on an urban base, but it's really, I don't see it as serving as, a, as an example for other countries. So I want to say that. So then your question is, uh, what kind of uh, strategies are being done? Progressive policies in terms progressive of inclusion policy. and citizen engagement. Uh, well, um, you know, one of the new trends is, is sort of more s citizen participation. Brazil kind of led that, and it, it was an urban, it wasn't a primate city. In, in Brazil, but in, um, right, the second, Porto Alegre, I'm sorry, I was blanking on the name, uh, became really a model uh, for uh, citizen participation, democratic involvement in decision making, and that became a model in Brazil and has been picked up in many other countries. So there are some very interesting models out there that are developing that are new 
and that are more responsive to the concerns of ordinary people. Which doesn't mean they don't have their own sets of problems, but that, that they do reflect an effort to, um, to decentralize uh, political power. Um, and so you could say that's to secondary cities, uh, to new social classes, um, historically. So, and uh, com coming full circle a little bit of it as well, as if we're looking to go off and, and build cities of the future without precedent or without a model for that, how are we in fact going to make informed decision? How are we going to go off and develop those programs? We talk about evidence-based policy making here in the city of Boston an awful lot. And part of that is scientific evidence, part of it is social science evidence. What's the mechanism by which we go off and start to explore new ways or better ways of doing things as opposed to fighting the last war on a different landscape with different tools? We have one question for the audience, but one apologies, one comment I, I did just one bit. Um, and this goes both to both of your remarks. And I've only been to Singapore once, and I've spoken with a few of their officials. What I admire about Singapore is not so much um, what they, the choices they made, but at the civil service level, the process by which they made those choices. So uh, it was interesting. I, I heard a discussion with one of their folks on congestion pricing. And it was a very thoughtful process. It was evidence-based. They tried things that didn't work. They tried something else. And they were able to plan at sort of a regional level to get that done. And I have nothing against New Jersey, Connecticut, or Long Island, but it's simply much more complicated for New York because mm -hmm. with the best will in the world, it's just a lot of different people in the room.